watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. Yay! Hi, I'm Sarah Connor and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's episode, I am so excited to launch my new project. It's called Connecticut Fed Going Local. And basically, I'm going to be taking the next few months to explore the ins and outs of trying to source most of my food that I can source from Connecticut from Connecticut. I've already kind of been dabbling in the process and I've had many of my guests encouraging, encouraging me to do this. Uh, Maureen Hazley Jones, the English lady, was my first guest who kind of nudged me in that direction when we were talking about vegetable gardening and the importance of knowing where your food comes from and how it was grown. Because just think how, you know, the, the fruit and vegetables you get in the store, when was the last time it really tasted like a real tomato, you know, or a real lovely That's piece true. of fruit. And how long have, have those, has that stuff been languishing on a truck? How many miles has that truck come? Mm -hmm. And never mind the carbon footprint that, right. that it's making. The environmental impact. Right. right, and the chemicals that have been sprayed on, on the fruit, which has taken away a lot of the taste, and also those chemicals you're ingesting into your body, mm -hmm. which can cause all kinds of problems. So one of the big reasons to know where your food comes from is to make sure it's healthy and you know what you're putting in your body. One of the challenges of eating locally is finding a, a source for your food. Now I picked kind of the low hanging fruit and I'm going to be doing this during the summer when all of the farmers markets are pretty much open all over the state. So the first thing I did was I tried to find a farmers market and a, a resource for how exactly I'm going to be able to do this. Rita Decker Perry at the Billings Forge Farmers Market was fantastic in giving me some tips. Take a look at my field trip. So I'm out on a field trip at Billings Forge Farmers Market down here on Broad Street in Hartford and I am joined by Rita Decker Perry and she runs this market and she's going to share with us a little bit about the farmers market and um, the Connecticut grown movement that is uh, growing across the state. Thank you for sharing the market with me today. Sarah, it's my pleasure. It's so my pleasure. Tell us a little bit about Billings Forge and how this came to be, how long it's been around. Okay, Billings Forge, we are not, this is a nonprofit where you are. It's um, a, the original building is a original forge. It did wrenches. It was purchased three years ago by the Melville Trust, which is a charitable trust with their emphasis is to find and fight the causes of homelessness. So this is 98 unit apartments that are low cost subsidized, they're either HUD, Section 8, and some are full cost as well. So it's a good eclectic mix of all different people. So we have that. We also have the firebox as part of it. That's also that's the investment part of the trust. Obviously, again, I'm a nonprofit. We have art studios, artists in residence who in exchange for having the studio get to teach classes. We also decided that we really needed a farmer's market because this is a true food desert. There's no grocery stores in the greater Hartford area. So that's the definition of a that food desert. A food is desert is, an urban food desert is no grocery store within one mile radius of the location. Okay. Rural is 10 miles. So this is a true food desert. So we thought, how could we bring healthy choices other than what's available at the bodegas and the package stores mm -hmm. to the residents? So this was the most easiest option for us. It started three years ago, real small in the parking lot of the firebox, and grew so quickly that we moved into this beautiful green space where we are today. So it's been in existence for three years? Three years. And you've seen it grow year It is year. grown uh, substantially. It's more than doubled in sales every year. This year we also have probably four more vendors than we had last year. So it's also the first year we went year round. Through the winter we stayed in the studio, which is a building across from from the firebox, which is on our property. And we were Thursday nights, and we had a few of our vendors that stayed with us that had enough storage crops, and then we had coffee, cheese, and the meat vendors, so we had enough to keep going. And then we subsidized it where we brought in some other produce from the regional farmer's market that was locally grown. Okay, so pretty much everything that you find here at Billings Forge is 
lo real local or within a, do you have a definition of what local? Um, well, we are, Connecticut a, we are a Connecticut grown market. Okay, so everything is, is from Connecticut. Connecticut. It has to be from Connecticut, yes. Okay, so one of the reasons why I'm visiting the farmer's market is because I'm going to experiment this summer with trying to convert my family's food as much local as possible. Good for you. And see what that means and what the challenges are. If they're going to eat all the greens that I know are going to come across our CSA. <laughs> so, um, so how easy is it to, you know, convert your eating to local? I mean, in Connecticut, we are we do have tough winters. Uh huh. So, what is your advice for that project? Well, there's a couple of different things. One, you want to, you know, sort of get a little bit smarter about what's available, how to extend what you have. I mean, obviously, you probably don't have a root cellar, but you probably have a cool place in a basement or maybe even in, in a, a clean place in a garage where you could store potatoes, squashes. I mean, maybe you want to learn how to can. Maybe, you, you know, freezing things. I, at the end of the season, I love peppers. I will have like 10, 20 pounds of them. Just cut them up, put them in the freezer, and I, you can take them out. They're as fresh as the day you picked them. So, you know, it, it's just being a little bit smarter and thinking ahead. Right. So I took the low-hanging fruit of starting this project in the summer <laughs> when I knew things would be growing. But at the end of the summer, plan ahead. Yep, so you already have a plan, produce. though, even now. Right. I mean, you know, you could, when tomatoes come into season, you could start making your own tomato sauce. You know, the abundance of apples when you're, you know, you and your husband and your children say, Mom, not another apple. You start <laughs> thinking, well, maybe I'll make applesauce. You have to think out of the box a little bit. Right. But there are a lot more growers that are growing in greenhouse because winter markets are starting to expand. Um, so the, the Connecticut grown. Um, state campaign. We are in the city, so you're hearing the sounds of the city around us. Um, the Connecticut Grown uh, campaign, you see those signs, uh, yes. in the, even in the supermarkets, you see them outside supermarkets. Yes. Um, uh, it's waiting for the music to stop. Um, have you seen that kind of boost the the interest and the actual people in using that? Ab absolutely, cars? absolutely. Well, a lot of people, what they call the, the LCD, the low carbon diet. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of different campaigns. The USDA started Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, which I support and I love that campaign. And I think it's phenomenal because you should know who you're, who's growing your food and where it's coming from. <laughs> to me, the days when I walk in this market and I see Catherine biting into one of her own apples and this one's sitting there picking out a bag of lettuce, you know, they haven't scrubbed it with you know, dug detergent, they're not afraid of it. You know, it right. hasn't been, you know, shipped thousands of miles into an industrialized location where then it's then processed and shipped out. Mm -hmm. You know, regretfully, people, get, their minds have changed, their mindsets have changed because grocery stores aren't seasonal anymore. And right. food is seasonal. You, to have you know it what? You if you it. think you can get, you know, a, a cucumber, you know, all year long and it's going to taste great, or tomatoes is the perfect example, and corn. I mean, Strawberries, tomatoes, and corn in Connecticut, short season, best thing in the world. Yes. You know, so if you're buying it outside of it, you know, I, I don't know, it just, to me, it, it just doesn't make sense. But I have seen a huge, I have customers that have tried to, and they, they'll come in and they'll go, okay, this week I'm going to see if I can only buy from, from farmer's markets and not go into a grocery store. So you do see people a coming people. in and they're oh. giving themselves uh, the yeah. local challenge. Oh, a big time local challenge, mm -hmm. a lot of them. And, and one gentleman with a a family of, of four children and he came back the next week I said well how'd you do it he said I broke down I had to buy butter I had to go to a <laughs> store and buy butter right so there are certain things that you may yeah but I like I said have. I do think and I don't advocate that anybody should not you know I mean go out to dinner or try different things but mm -hmm. there's absolutely no reason why you can't really try to eat healthy I mean for the people that think it costs more it really doesn't cost that much more because the overall health costs Mm -hmm. You know what what you're saving and how you're you're healthy and you're not needing to take you know extra vitamins and do all these extra things and you know you're you're eating what's local so you're protecting the environment you know you're, you're supporting a local farmer most of these farmers grow on less than 18 acres and they grow within 20 miles of here right so, it is amazing you can be right in the heart of the city and not go 20 miles and you're in farm country. Right. It is amazing. Yep. Um, so another question I have for you is we are in the city and mm -hmm. um, I know you do uh, participate in programs for um, people who are on lower income and get subsidies for food. Mm -hmm. um, do you see people taking advantage of that at the oh, farmer's market? Tre tremendously, tremendously. Um, we are. We originally was one of the only and now there's a few more markets that are starting to engage. We have an EBT machine which allows us to take 
SNAP, which is a Supplemental Nutritional Assistant Program, which is food stamps. We also take WIC senior coupons and the new WIC farmers market coupons. And it's really been a very rewarding experience. We've seen that grow. The first year we started, we took $360 in SNAP benefits in. Last year we took over $3,000. Wow. Difficult. We have, of course, built beds. Yes, here. they're beautiful. Behind us yep. are um, some built beds that will. So this, the the community show supports, some and this mm -hmm. is, you know, this is another thing. You, you know, you don't need a lot of space to grow a lot of food. Food. I mean, mm -hmm. you can grow a tremendous amount, and these are all four by eights, and we not only have taught people. You know, some of these kids didn't even, you know, to them, where does the tomato come from? Stop and shop. Right. It's, it's in, you know, th this is a whole new learning process, and it's been a lot of fun. And it teaches them where to grow, and you're surprising how much produce we get out of here. Yeah, so the benefits of uh, education. Yeah, many benefits. benefits. It's one of the things I'm hoping to do with my girls is bring them out and visiting farms and seeing things growing and maybe being more interested in eating the greens if they see them coming out of the ground, <laughs> you know, and pick it, helping to pick them yeah. or, or whatever, picking them out, whatever it might be. Um, thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure, Sarah. Thank you. Do you, you. think I'm going to be able to meet this challenge? I think you are. I, I think hope you so. should have no problems, especially coming into summer when all the markets start blooming. Right. You right. Know, yeah. it, they've really May, caught on. So this is May. It's, it's a lighter um, availability, but there's still a lot here. Oh, oh, yeah. There still is. All the greens, the asparagus, rhubarb, parsnips. There's a, there's a lot to be had still. That's great. Thank you so much, thank Rita. Thank you. My pleasure, I'm Sarah. I'm off to go shop. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy your day. Thanks. So Rita was a great resource in giving me some tips on how to best eat locally. And one of the things she said was to make sure you get to know your farmer. I've had a guest on a couple times, uh, Terry Walters, who has also given me some great advice on why it's important to know where your food comes from and how to eat locally. Take a look at some of the advice that Terry gave me. One of the other things that I love just about coming to a farm, any farm, is just bringing my children. Yes, I have and my I children with me today. They're having fun. And I know you're a mom, so I know that you have the same concern as I do with getting my children to eat a healthy diet. And I teach them, you know, eat all the colors of the rainbow. But there's something really poignant about bringing them to the farm and having them experience to see where the food comes from. And I think that's a piece that's missing from our culture in general is understanding where our food comes from. So it's one thing to say it's so important to support your local economy, to support your environment, for, to provide clean food locally to our communities, and that connects us. But it's another thing to understand what that really means. And until you go have a chance to go to the farm, you don't see that. I bring my children to the farm, I bring my children to the dump, and they see that cycle that everything comes from someplace and goes someplace. So Terry is someone who's clearly passionate about knowing where your food comes from and really getting to know your local farmers and having them help you out. When I told my family that I wanted to do this project, and they obviously have to come along with me because I'm feeding them this food, um, the one comment my husband Scott said was he really didn't want to become a vegetarian. Um, so I had to find a local farmer who um, grows animals for meat. And so I it wasn't very difficult, actually. Um, down the road in Barkhamstead, there's Eaglewood Farms, and David Finn was a fantastic resource for me to really understand um, what he does and um, how he grows his animals in a very humane um, and sustainable way. Take a look at our field trip out to the farm. I am out in Barkhamstead, Connecticut, at Eaglewood Farms with David Finn, the owner, and he's going to share with us a little bit about the um, farming that he does. David, tell us about Eaglewood Farms. Eaglewood Farms is a farm that we're located in Barkhamstead, Connecticut. We have a farm store. We do various markets throughout the state of Connecticut. We do beef and pork. Um, we're a livestock grower. That's what we do. And so I found David because I was looking for a local meat grower because my husband said he did not want to become a vegetarian throughout this project of trying to source locally. And um, so I came out and I started asking David questions. And some of the things you shared with me are how you grow the beef and the pork. And share a little bit about sure. that. Uh, well, we don't use any antibiotics, any of our processing. We do not use any nitrates or MSG. Uh, our pigs are on vegetables and brewer's gain, a byproduct of the brew industry. Okay. 
Uh, we pick that up in Connecticut from Hooker Beer and the Cambridge House, who supply it to us. It is uh, their waste from making beer. And we're sustainable, so we're using it to feed our animals. It has a high protein content, uh, very, very good feed for them. It's labor intensive, but you get them to the using, animal. Using the, using the grain. Right, we have to pick it up, you have to scoop it out. It's not just dumping it out of a bag, out of a feed bag, right, out of a right, silo. Right. So there's a process to there's getting it. There's a process to getting it. Uh, we also use vegetables that we get from uh, local sources. We're actually now getting into the vegetable season and we'll be getting our vegetables from uh, Wild Carrot out of uh, what's, which used to be Bristol's Farm and Gresit. So all farm. of the feed is local? We try to do as much natural. local as we can. We yeah. get our hay locally from fields around us. We don't own our own hay ground, so we buy in our own hay. Um, and then you also, um, when I came to visit about a week ago, you had a huge shipment of food from Food Share. Yes, yes, we get Food this. Share. We, we get the uh, byproduct from Food Share. Uh, any of the vegetables that are going past due that uh, they can't get out to their clients, we either go in and pick it up or they'll bring it out to us. So it's sustainable. It's not going to the dump. It's all being used. So tell me a little bit about when I came in, um, I think you get a lot of people coming in, I got the impression, who have read the books like um, Omnivore's Dilemma and all these things talking about grass-fed beef and how corn-fed is corn -fed beef is bad and feedlots and all of that. So talk a little bit about how your cows are raised and your philosophy with the grass versus a little bit of grain or how you feed them. And okay. Well, we do do a grass-fed animal. It's usually on the smaller side. I have uh, now started doing, we cut some silage in the fall, we'll start cutting silage. Of course silage we is? Is corn stalks, stalks, ears, okay. everything. Okay, Literally, so what's left over no, from? What's left over okay. or it can be planted just for silage. Okay. Um, and what you're doing is you're cutting it up and we feed that to the cows. The issue with the uh, corn silage is the GMOs, okay. the genetic, genetically modified. Um, so what we have come to conclude is that we need to get the size of the calves up for frame. Okay. We, my feeling has gotten to be is we're really putting a stress because we're, we're a small farm, we don't have hundreds of acres here, um, is to get them to build some frame. So we're doing it a little different. We feed the mom and the yearlings up to a year old, small amount of silage in the brewer's grain. Then let them finish on, like the grass behind you, they haven't okay. been turned out on. We don't finish them on 40 pounds of grain like a feed lot would be get size. So you don't try and beef them up in the end? We let, we try to give them the build a good frame, it's just like our children. We try to give them the good things we want to come up with. Then okay. let them take the time to grow and develop. So by starting them on the silage and the brewer's grain, We're they're their structure is big enough that they can add a little bit more. They get a little more frame. They're not competing. Let's say we have a calf in the middle of winter. All we're doing is feeding hay and village. Mm -hmm. That's all they're getting. Right. The old timers, we always did grain for 50 years because it was cheap. Okay. That's why we started feeding corn. Cows aren't designed to have corn. So but it was an economic. It was an economic thing. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking at now is moderation. That's what Balancing. I'm Balancing what they need. Uh, we don't want to just say, okay, we're not going to give it to you because you've got to be grass fed and we can only sell grass fed. Mm -hmm. My animals come first. Yeah. So sorry. you're saying it's yeah. better for the um, health of the animal? I feel it's better on the, I, right. in our situation, it's mm -hmm. better for the health of the animal. And again, we're not feeding 40, 50 pounds. They're getting two pitchforks full right. of silage. It's a minimal amount. But the person should know what they're getting in their food. That way, if they don't want it, they can find another source. Right. I mean, I feel honesty is the best thing to say. Here's what you're getting. You have a choice. Right. So become educated. Right. And which if is, it's... Right. Yeah. Which is important. And ask the questions. 
Yeah, ask a question come to the farmer. Come and see you come because and see you're the farmer. very happy to answer the questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, there's some people that will say I'm totally wrong. And there's mm -hmm. some people that say I really don't care how it tastes. Right. My thing is I look at the animals. Mm -hmm. Are they happy? Are they looking good? That's who, you know, we got to, it's not just the food we're putting in our body. It's, you know, they're one of God's creatures, too, we got to take care of. Right. So we are here actually in the, um, it's, I don't know, what do you, do you call it a pig pen? What do you call you it? You call this a pig pen. A pig yep. pen. We're literally in the pig pen. And these are all the, um, not the most recent piglets, right, Dave? No. No. no these are wean piglets. So what we do is bring them down from the main barn. We put them down here. The piglets you see with the little yellow ear tags are all going to be future breeders. They're Next year, they'll be having the piglets for the season. Okay, so the yellow tags are the future mamas. Uh, future mamas <laughs> or sows after they've had a litter. Um, they have little one nervous. little boar hog in here. His name's Brutus. He's around, running around in the corner over there. But uh, <laughs> he will be a future breeder for all of these females. He's from a different litter. We watch our genetics, the not in a breed. And we also have these little piglets that don't. And those are ones we usually have for sale. We still have a lot of people that come around and want to bring a couple of piglets on. Oh, okay. That's so you sell right you sell here. live piglets. We sell live piglets. Okay. And then what about the piglets that that um, end up being pork? What are those? As these get a little bigger, um, they'll be moved back up into the barn, and they will be called feeder pigs. Okay. And then they'll be grown up for the next four months, and then they'll be used as a meat product. Okay. How do you girls, after seeing the pigs? Because we like pork. We eat pork as a family. We eat pork. How do you, does it change your mind about how you eat them? Oh, they are cute. I'm not going to eat anymore. No, no, really? No. Honey, <laughs> let, let me explain this to you. Listen to what Dave has to say about that. There's nothing wrong. I mean, if you don't want to eat meat, that's your choice. But if you do, what you want to do is find out where the animals came from, where they treated with love and respect while they spent this time on the earth to feed you. Yeah, I think that's true. And that's the right? great they thing. They look like they're happy? Yeah. Okay, see? So... So that's the lesson, is to make sure, to know your farmer, know where your food is coming from, and how the animals, and the earth, if you're getting vegetables and things, are being treated. So David was a fantastic resource to me, and it was really great to bring the girls out. One of my goals for this Connecticut Fed project is to have my girls really understand where their food comes from, and how it's grown, and the choices that they have to make. Um, and I know that um, going out to a farm and actually seeing the animals that will eventually become meat um, is a little controversial. And one of the things I want to do with this Connecticut Fred project is have it be an ongoing conversation. I really want to hear what you think about it. So I have a brand new website, sarahconnor.net, and it's a blog. And I'll be talking about my experiences throughout the summer in addition to producing a show each month to kind of um, summarize what I've been up to. So please check it out, join the conversation, and let me know what you're thinking. Another thing about this Connecticut Fed project is that you can't get any more local than your own backyard. So I had my first homegrown success um, in growing my own produce. So take a look at what um, I've been up to. Hi, I'm really excited because I've hit my first milestone in my Connecticut Fed project. I am ready to harvest my first um, vegetable. Back in the spring, in mid-April, um, before my community garden was available, and before you could really plant pretty much anything else, I put out some cold crops in some containers, which is kind of a neat idea if you don't have a lot of space in your yard or you don't have a community garden. You can grow things in containers as long as you give the roots enough space to grow. So what I planted was um, some peas, which you can see here are starting to climb, because peas uh, can stand the cold before you have the last frost date. And then I have some scallions, some green onions that I'm growing here in these containers. You can see they're pretty big. And the, this uh, wire is to keep out the um, uh, any like chipmunks or deer or anything that might come and um, try and eat your vegetables. 
So what I have here is spinach, and spinach is a great cold crop, and it actually won't grow very well in the summer, and I'm getting ready to harvest it for um, dinner tonight. And there are a couple different ways that you can do it. Um, one is you can just cut the whole plant down at the root, which I'm not going to do because I'm hoping to get some more out of it. Um, you can also just um, individually cut each leaf. Um, I don't know if you can see that if the shot is close enough. But you can just take your kitchen scissors and just cut, cut each leaf that looks, looks ready, which is what I'm doing here. Another thing you can do is um, you can cut the plant about an inch, the, cut the whole plant about an inch from the stems. And then that apparently, so I've read, if you cut the whole plant, um, a whole nother set of leaves will come up um, in that space. So I think I'm just going to go with the cutting the leaves because some of these other ones are not very big. And you can see I have plenty for a salad for my family. I'm so excited. So I'm going to harvest the rest of these and then I will um, be back with what the final product looks like. Okay, so I um, washed up the spinach and the great thing about it is because I grew it myself, I know exactly what went on the spinach and I put nothing on the spinach, so I just had to wash the dirt off, which was very easy. And then I mixed it with um, a little bit of olive oil, and then you can see there's some goat cheese on there, and that is garlic and dill goat cheese from Sweet Pea Farm in, out in North Granby. So um, the spinach is from my backyard. That's You can't get more local than that. And the goat cheese is from uh, North Granby. I'm going to give so, it a try. Delicious. So something I didn't say in that segment is that the spinach was noticeably different than the store-bought spinach. It was like eating buttery spinach. It was really um, very, very tender. Something that also has happened during this project is that it can be really overwhelming to think about, oh my gosh, I have to change my entire way of eating. So I have one more segment with Terry when she joined me and some of the advice she had about making the transition to, into eating a little bit healthier. It's not all or nothing. You don't have to be overwhelmed and go into your kitchen and completely empty your cabinets, you know, clean out all of the boxes of stuff and start over. You just pick and choose, baby steps, move along the spectrum where it makes sense for you and your family. Absolutely. Yeah, slow steps. And you mm -hmm. know what? The slower you make changes, the less pressure you put on yourself, the yeah. more you can allow <laughs> yourself to be right. nourished by your food. Right. And so while it can be overwhelming, there are really one step at a time things that you can do to make this a very easy process. And you don't even have to go the whole way of eating completely local. Um, simple things like you can buy the Connecticut farmer milk or the Connecticut grown eggs, which you can find in most supermarkets now. I hope I've inspired you to join me in the conversation. I really would like to include as many people as possible and, and get your ideas and your thoughts. I know that this project may at times be overwhelming. I know it will be very educational for myself and my family, and I hope it will uh, build a community of people trying to find locally sourced foods, whether you live in Connecticut or if you're watching this show from across the country. Um, you can get more information about all of the different field trips I've taken, where the farms are, links to their websites, um, as well as the Connecticut Grown website that the Department of Agriculture in Connecticut um, has up and has lots of great information. So join me in the conversation. Check out sarahconnor.net. And I look forward to talking with you over the next month. And stay tuned for a brand new episode of Life and Style with Sarah, Connecticut Grown, Growing Local, next month.